the ASA principle, ASA. Look at me for a second. I am not exaggerating or kidding you when I tell you that this is one of the most powerful principles you can learn to have the victory in your life. So please ask the Lord to help you at this time to get hold of this and to put it into practice. I, I simply call it the ASA principle. Let's look at the notes. It says the wonderful ASA principle is found in Mark chapter 5 and verse 36, where it says, as soon as. So there's the ASA principle already, as soon as. <clears throat> of course, we've got to take the rest of the message to amplify that, but at least that is the start of it. ASA. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. But we've got to read several verses to get the context. So it says here, here's the whole context. And it'll take a few minutes to read this, but let's go. Mark 5, 21 through 43. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship onto the other side, that is back to Capernaum. Look, look this way, look this way. Capernaum, I've said it before to you. Capernaum, Caper over there is for a village. Nahum is the prophet in the Old Testament. So it really was the village of Nahum the prophet. And they would call it Capernaum. We put it together and we call it Capernaum. But it literally is the village of Nahum the prophet. Anyway, let's look back again at the start of that. When Jesus was passed over again by ship onto the other side, that is back to Capernaum on the west side. Much people gathered unto him, that is, multitudes were waiting, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, the word is, look with wonder. Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet in an act of worship. And that took something for a ruler of the synagogue to do that. And Jairus, verse 23, besought him greatly, besought Jesus, that is, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. Look this way again. The Bible teaches about two points, the point of death and the point of contact. And usually the point of death can only be overcome by the point of contact. That is, you establish a contact with God and release your faith to overcome death. But he said, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee. You can hear the, the, the sorrow and the passion in his voice. I pray thee, in his words, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, which was wonderful. And much people followed and thronged him. There's probably thousands of people there. But then there was a terrible interruption. Not terrible in the sense of the lady who did the interruption, but terrible for Jairus, because his little girl was dying. Jesus was on his way to heal her, hopefully, and now Jesus, it seems, is sidetracked. And maybe in your life sometimes it seems that Jesus is sidetracked in getting the answer to you. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians in trying to help her, they actually give her extra pain and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. She kept paying these doctors, but they couldn't help her. So she kept getting worse. And when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind or the press of the crowd. People were milling around him and she touched his garment. For she said, in the original it is, she said, and she kept on saying it probably to herself. She kept on saying, and she was weak and the crowd was big. But she kept saying, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. That was the point of contact. If you're at the point of death, you need a point of contact. If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be, and then she said, whole, W-H-O-L-E, marvelous word. And straightway, 
The fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body. She just knew she was healed of that plague. No, it wasn't a blessing. Sickness is not a blessing. It was a plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, or power. Look this way again. Sometimes after I speak and I go back in here, in my spirit I'm so strong. Physically I'm just, just totally wiped out. You know that you've been drained. And even Jesus knew that power had gone out of him through the point of contact. And Jesus, verse 30, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned about in the press or the milling throng and said, who touched my clothes? It doesn't mean that he didn't know, but he was demanding an answer. Who touched my clothes? In fact, I think that Moffat's translation is the best of all on this. For Moffat says that Jesus said, who made a demand on my ability? Who touched my clothes? Or who just made a demand on my ability? And his disciples, of course, they're operating totally in the natural. They said unto him, and it seemed reasonable, thou seest the multitude thronging thee. People are everywhere. And yet you say, who touched me? What do you mean? Everybody's jostling up against you and pushing around you. We can hardly keep the crowd here at bay. What do you mean? But Jesus knew, of course, what he was talking about, obviously. And he looked around to see her that had done this thing. He knew all the time, but she wanted him, he wanted her to confess it. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, now she not only got healed, she just got saved. At the start it says a certain woman. It doesn't say that anymore. For it says in verse 34, he said unto her, Daughter, she was now in the kingdom of God. Daughter, thy faith, your faith, your trust, has made you whole. W-H-O-L-E, marvelous word, I say again. Go in peace. That word peace there, you know, go in, in, in right relationship with God. She was healed and saved, and it all happened through a point of contact. Look this way again. Point of contact, there's a whole lot in the Bible. The Bible talks about confessing our sins, the laying on of hands, the anointing of oil, the reading of the God's Word, and so forth. Those are all points of contact. And it's always good to establish a point of contact to release your faith. You know, on the first Sunday of the month when we lay hands upon people, I always give the illustration, you know, of a, of a, a toaster or a vacuum cleaner or something. I mean, you've got to plug it in. The electric's there all the time, but you've got to plug it in and then the power comes. And God established throughout the Bible points of contact. And when you are in need, you should look for a point of contact. Sometimes the giving of an offering. Sometimes the saying of a praise the Lord or, or, or a singing of a hymn. Something that helps you to turn away from yourself and to turn to God. And the only thing that can turn away the point of death or let's say the point of defeat is by the use of a point of contact. And that's really brought out in this story. But it's the next part we want to look at, so we're going to read on. But let me continue with verse 34. He said unto her daughter, she's now in the kingdom, how did it happen through your faith that made you whole, not just healed in your body, but you're saved in your soul, go in peace, in right relationship with God. And here's what the original says. When Jesus said, be whole of thy plague, the original says that Jesus said, Be whole of thy plague, because it shall never return. That's wholeness, isn't it? Be whole of thy plague, because it shall never return. Verse 35. This is where it gets very interesting as far as our emphasis is tonight. It's all wonderful, of course. But here's what happened. There had been now, look this way again, there was now such a delay. Jairus had come, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, a lot of people wouldn't have done it in his position, but the sickness of his little girl drove him. They did not care what people said. He came, he fell down in the dust. He said, Jesus, come and do something for my little girl. She's just 12. Jesus sets off. Time is off the essence. The child is dying. And now this woman comes along, gets healed. Jesus stops, preaches for a bit. 
Time is lost. So it seems so unfortunate from his standpoint. And so it says in verse 35, while he yet spake, while he was still speaking to the woman who had been gloriously saved and healed, but it had caused a delay in reaching Jairus' daughter, while he yet spake, verse 35, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, a certain person, one of his own family, Mr. Negative. He said, thy daughter is dead. Now that's bad enough. It's the next bit that was horrible. Why troublest thou the master any further? You could almost feel sarcasm there. The master, <laughs> he's not master over this. She's dead, forget it. And then he said it would only be a trouble anyway. Jesus never taught that. He was moved with compassion, was happy to help people. But this is what he said. Your daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Can you imagine, friends, what that was like for that ruler of the synagogue to hear that? And that second when he heard it and he knew there had been a delay, what flashed into his mind of grief and sorrow and crying and, and breaking down and, and yet feeling if that woman hadn't have delayed Jesus, he could have been there. All those emotions in kind of a split second or two. But it's what happened when Jesus spoke again that changed everything. This is the principle that we will learn tonight as never before, hopefully. Here's what it says. Are you ready? I'll read 35 again so that we can kind of slide into 36. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, your daughter's dead. Forget it. It's all over. You have no chance for a miracle. Why troublest thou the master any further? The thing has got to the point where not even the master can help. What can he do about death? Verse 36, as soon as, as soon as the ASA principle, we'll come back on this, of course, but hear it, as soon as Jesus didn't wait one minute, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. He countered it immediately, instantly. He countered the bad news with the good news. He countered the negative with the positive instantly. As soon as, verse 36, Jesus heard the word that was spoken. He saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, what sweet words, be not afraid, only believe. The exact opposite of the words just spoken. Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken. In other words, he wasted no time to counteract the bad news with the good news. That's the point to remember. Verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him. He wouldn't allow any man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Just those three to go to the house of Jairus. What did Jairus feel at this time? And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. You notice a difference there. And seeth the tumult and then a different one and them that wept and wailed greatly because that was the professional mourner group. They brought in professional wailers, people who could wail and cry and they did it professionally. So that's who they were. They had them in already. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, verse 38, and saith the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly, that is the professional mourners. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Wow, what a thing to say. Verse 40, and they laughed him, that is the professional wailers. They laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, Jesus didn't believe in them or what they were doing. Look this way again. Yes, she was dead to everybody else, but to Jesus, she was just sleeping. In other words, what is totally hopeless to us is not hopeless to him. What is beyond to us is not beyond to him. She's dead. No, she's just sleeping because she was within his power. Verse 40, they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, that's what they got for laughing. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel. Somebody means little girl. And them that were with him, 
That's Jesus, the three disciples, the father and mother. There's half a dozen people, and there entereth in where the damsel was lying dead. She was dead. And he took the damsel by the hand. Don't you wish you could have been there to see this? Oh, my. He took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha. This is Aramaic. Talitha, really, is what he said. Talitha. Kumai. Talitha. Some people believe Talitha was her actual name. Talitha, little darling, get up. It's time to get up, honey. Talitha. Which is being interpreted, damsel, honey, little girl, Talitha, I say unto thee, arise. What power in Jesus' name. What's hopeless to us is not hopeless to him. And immediately he had her by the hand. The little girl arose and walked, for she was the age of 12 years. And you can be sure of the next part. They were astonished with a great astonishment. And then he did something strange. He charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. She hadn't been eating. She needed to get her strength back. And he said, don't, don't tell that crowd out there. If you tell those people out there, they're, they're, we would say they're nosy. They're curious. They'll push in just to touch her and so forth. Keep them out there. And then Jesus and the three disciples, they just walked away. What, what a Savior we have. He charged them straightly, verse 43, that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Cook her a meal. You know, in the Bible, we only have record of Jesus raising three people from the dead. This is one of them. And then I say this. Here again, and we read it in that reading, but here again is Mark 5, 36. You don't know, friends, tonight how deep this is in me and how much I'm going to try to get this over to you. As soon as, here it is again, as soon as, Jesus heard the word that was spoken. He saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Notice, it says in your notes, notice how quickly Jesus countered the devil's words with God's words. Instantly, he shot back, teaching us a lesson. Look at me for a moment. When the devil comes to you and says something, you don't wait five minutes, half an hour, one hour, three days, a month, meditating on what the devil said. You counter it immediately with God's words. That's the secret. I want to read that bit again. Notice how quickly Jesus countered the devil's words with God's words. Notice how quickly, as soon as, A-S-A, -A, Jesus countered the devil's words with God's words. Notice these three amazing words, as soon as. We could say instantly, instantly. What lessons we can learn from those words to be used, from these words to be used in our Christian walk. Spiritually speaking, now we got a little deeper into it. We must learn the secrets of quick on the draw. Rapid response, spiritually speaking. First responder. I'm going to come back on these things. The devil always tries to use one or more of these four devices against us. He either attacks us or surprises us or tempts us or discourages us. And then it says here, in each instance, we are to respond immediately do not take minutes or hours or days to meditate on what the devil is saying. Rather, jump on it as soon as, uh, rather, jump on it as soon as. Learn the power of the word no when dealing with the devil, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Yeah, let me read the next bit, then I'll come back on a whole lot of this. Look at Romans 8, 36 and 37. For as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, we're not going to say that. No, Paul said, 
In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In just the next bit, and we'll go back then. Uh, please get this. If the devil gets you in the first five minutes of the day, he has a great chance of dominating you all day long. Do not allow it to happen. So go back now a little bit to where it says, spiritually speaking, we must learn the secrets of quick on the draw. Spiritually speaking. So look this way for a moment or two. I'm sure you remember in some of those funny things you see in TV where you have the cowboy, you know, and he says, I'm going to draw real fast his gun. And he's standing there and then he says, do you want to see it again? Meaning he did it that fast you didn't see it. Of course, that was just a joke. I'm looking into your heart and into your life. This is simple, but it's profound at the same time and yours too. And I tell you spiritually, you will save yourself so much trouble, maybe weeks or months or years of trouble, if you know how to be quick on the draw. As soon as, as soon as the devil speaks, you contradict it instantly. And if you don't, and you let it get into your head, and then in two or three minutes, it's in your spirit, then you're heavy then you're negative, then you feel bad. And then the devil starts to build upon it throughout the day or throughout the week, and it goes from one thing to another. Whatever the situation is, when you know the devil has planted something in your head or in your heart, you must know how to be spiritually quick on the draw. And you fire back instantly God's Word. For instance, most of us, I believe, are spiritually astute, and we have being matured in the Lord to the point where we know when it's the devil and when it's God, when the devil comes to you with something negative that's going to hurt you, oh, you'll never be healed. Oh, you'll never get out of this debt. Oh, you'll never, never get out of this problem or whatever it is. You don't meditate upon that. Within two or three minutes, you're pulled down. You can't, you can't operate in that. Instantly, you train yourself and you fire back. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. No matter what you feel like, you learn how to be quick on the draw. And I tell you again, many a person has gone into weeks and months and maybe even years on a kind of a steady, slippery slope because at the beginning they didn't know how to be quick on the draw. They didn't know how to fire back, but you got to do it quickly or the devil will get the upper hand. For when this man come in who was so negative, why do you trouble the master? The master, it's almost sarcastic. Ha, what can the master do about death? Your problem is beyond even the master. So give up, come home and conduct the funeral. But Jesus heard what he said. And the Bible says, as soon as Jesus heard that terrible negative report, Jesus countered it with God's word. Don't be afraid, he said, just believe. What a change. So look what it says here. Spiritually speaking, we must learn the secrets of quick on the draw. Rapid response. You remember a few weeks ago there, well, it was probably only 10 days ago, they had that disaster in Burma. Myanmar, they call it now. And of course, the ruling army, Unta, got into such worldwide criticism because what? There was no rapid response to help people. And when the U.S. wanted to fly in planes filled with medicine and so forth, they wouldn't allow them. Finally, some did get in. But the point is, there was no rapid response. After 9-11, we heard that term a lot, either rapid response or first responder. When something happens, you move in immediately. Now, we do that, of course, today if the fire breaks out or if there's a terrible murder or something. What do we do? Well, you don't hang around for a month saying, let's have a committee meeting on this. 911, it's all set up for that. 911. I know in our area of Tarpon Springs, maybe you have it where you live, they have got what the police call reverse 911, where the police call you. If there's an animal loose or if there's something bad in the neighborhood, they call you and warn you to stay in. Rapid response, rapid response. That's why when you're driving, you pull into the side of the road and let the ambulance by, you let the fire truck by, you let the police by while their sirens are going. What are they saying? There is an emergency and there's no time to lose. We've got to get there quickly. I cannot impress upon you enough that when the devil attacks, however it is, 
And there's different ways, and we'll come to that part in a moment also. But when the devil attacks, that you learn how to 911, how to respond instantly, and the best way you do it on the spot is by quoting God's Word. As soon as the devil fires something in, you fire something back. Don't, don't lie down and take it from him. He'll walk all over you. He, he's defeated foe, but if he thinks you don't know that or you don't realize it at any given moment, he will act as if he's not defeated. He will act as if he's the greatest victor there ever was, the greatest champion, and he'll walk all over you. You need to know about rapid response. You need to know about first responder. You need to know about... You want to see it again? <laughs> Quick on the draw. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting in your home or... Or, or you've just had a phone call, you just had a letter, or just had something, somebody say something nasty. I mean, we're in life. All of us are here. We're on the same planet. The devil comes in a thousand different ways. You've got to learn. I'm going to repeat it to be quick on the draw. And one of the most simple and most powerful ones is, have it on the tip of your tongue. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if that doesn't seem to do the trick, say it half a dozen times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord, and what it is like, instead of just a, a revolver, it's like you've taken a machine gun. The more you say it, rapid response, you're just mowing down those demons. You've got to know it. We learned that from Jesus. It's in Mark 5, 36. When the negative word came in, Jesus countered it instantly. And when the man said, forget it, it's hopeless. It's beyond. Jesus said, that's not true. Only believe. All things are possible to him that believeth. It says here, the devil always tries to use one or more of these four devices against us. One, he attacks us. Look this way. The Bible says sometimes he comes as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. The lion is the tribe of, the lion of, the tribe of Judah, but he comes as a roaring lion big frontal attack. Other times he comes as an adder or a snake. Surprise one. But the first one we look at is when the devil attacks you. How does it happen? Suddenly you feel a pain. Suddenly money you thought you were getting, now you're not getting. Somebody cut you out of the will or whatever. Suddenly there's devastating news and the devil has come right up to you and slammed you in the face, hit you in the solar plexus. You have to sit down just to gasp for a breath, as it were. What am I going to do? Learn, learn, learn. No matter how hopeless the situation, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Instead of you being paralyzed, his forward thrust will be paralyzed. Instead of you going under, he will go under. Because we learn from Jesus the ASA principle, and that is to hit back and to hit back instantly. But then there's not only the fact the devil attacks us. It says here the devil surprises us. There it is in number two. It says here, there's the illustration of the undercurrents. Did you hear about this story? Just yesterday, I believe it was. I may not have every little last detail right, but I think I do. But the general story is right. Just yesterday, I don't know if you're familiar with a place called Longboat Key. It's down there by Sarasota. It's a lovely place. We have been to it several times, although not recently. And this group of people, I came from New York. And there was two men, I said, I think they said they were in their 40s. They were good swimmers. And they went out there all happy to be in sunny Florida. They went out there to swim. And suddenly they get caught, I heard it on the news last night, with a riptide, the undercurrent. Didn't know it was there. And these strong fellows started to panic. And some people on the beach saw it and were able to go out and get them and haul them into the beach. They took them to hospital. Both of them were dead. That was just yesterday that happened. It gave me the illustration for the surprise attack. When the devil comes with the undercurrent, when you weren't expecting it, when it seemed to be a beautiful day, when everything seemed to be going fine, and then suddenly, wham, you get this news. We are taught not just to fight the devil, but to fight him as fast as you can. That's the big deal I'm talking about tonight. Rapid response. Why? Because, listen to it, the more length of time it takes you to finally pick yourself up, 
where you want to switch from the negative to the positive, and you want to say a few scriptures that'll help you, the longer that takes, the bigger the battle is, because the devil is compounding everything. He's piling on. You've heard the term piling on. He's piling on. He's piling on. He's piling on. Whereas if you can do it instantly, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's immediately hit. He hates God's word. When Jesus was in the Mount of uh, Temptation, what did Jesus use constantly? It is written. It is written. It is written. And every time the devil would come, Jesus said, it is written. And the devil had no answer for that. But here again, what I'm saying, when the devil comes, and even if it's an undercurrent surprise attack, and you're taken off guard, you've got to teach yourself. Not only will you fire back God's Word, but don't wait for three weeks to do it. Don't wait until you've told the whole world how awful things are. Start talking to God in praise and prayer, and start talking to the enemy in the sense of quoting God's Word. So I'm giving it to you again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the power there is not only mighty, but because it's so quick, that takes the devil by surprise. And remember, there's not one verse of Scripture written that's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us, the actual word is in the Greek, it's God breathed. It's, it's God that taught us through this lesson from Jesus that when the devil says something horrible, you reply with something straight out of God's Word, how that God's going to take hold of you. And even if it seems impossible, like it did for that little girl and for her dad who wondered Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, even if it seems impossible, hear what God has got to say about it. What's God's opinion of the matter? Fear not, he said, only believe. Then number three, he not only attacks us and surprises us, he tempts us. Now, listen. Some time back, it's a good while ago, but this actually happened. I heard it on Christian television. There's this group of young men being interviewed, probably in, the, I'd say, late teens and in their 20s. And they seem to be in fire for God. And so the interviewer was asking them, what's your next project? And they said, well, the Lord had led them that the next night or whenever it was, they were going to go down to the local strip club. Said, but we'll only drink orange juice, don't worry. Well, why do you want to do that? We want to witness to the girls. It's not worth commenting on. It's so stupid. They seem to be sincere, or else they were just using the Lord to fulfill their lusts. I don't know what it was, but it was so stupid. The devil comes to tempt us, and we will be tempted, whatever happens, because Jesus was perfect and he was tempted. But the secret is to do everything in your power, not to be in the place where you're giving the devil a hand to tempt you. You don't do that. If you have a problem with alcohol, you don't go near the stuff anymore. If you have a problem with dirty jokes, you don't mix with a company that tells dirty jokes, and so forth and so on. You don't do that. You stay as far away as possible. And although you've heard the story before, I have to include it for the sake of television and the internet and the tape of the young man. I've told you about him several times. In the old days, when he had a, a notice that there was a job uh, that he could apply for, and it was to drive a stagecoach and horses. And he went down there, and several fellows were in the room, and they were all applying. And uh, he sat at the end, and they were being interviewed. And one cowboy after the other was telling the examiner how he could take a team of horses and drive them this close to the edge of a, of a ravine. Another fellow said he could bring it this close. Another fellow, the young fellow at the end, put on his Stetson and walked out. And the man called him back, sir. He said, come back. He said, what do you want? He said, why are you leaving? Well, he said, there's no good me staying here. He said, I couldn't drive a team of horses like these boys can. Well, he said, son, have you got the job? What would you do? Oh, he said, it's obvious. Well, he said, what is it? He said, I would drive as far away from the edge as possible. Son, he said, you just got yourself a job. Now, you can't become a monk on the hill. You can't get outside of society. We all live here. 
But what you do is you don't get yourself involved where it's so obvious that temptation is going to come upon you and probably in areas where you are, you, you easily succumb to that particular temptation. Don't do it. Don't do it. So this is one great thing that we can use against the devil when he goes to tempt us to go in there or to go in there or talk to this person. There's a horrible old saying, but there's a lot of truth in it. And it says, if you lie down with the dogs, you get the fleas. You know that old saying? That's true. And if you go with the wrong people, you're going to get into trouble. That's it. And so when the devil comes to attack you or surprise you or to tempt you, though you will be tempted if you're living the most holy life, because Jesus was, but you can minimize it by staying away from temptation. Lead us not, Jesus said, lead us not, into temp to lead us not into temptation. Lead us in such a way that we will wisely follow you and minimize our temptations. That's the translation of that. Lead us not into temptation. You don't have to pray that Jesus won't lead you into temptation, for he won't. But the actual proper translation is, lead us in such a way that we'll follow you and therefore minimize our temptations. And then the devil comes to discourage us. Boy, can he ever discourage. I told you recently, I almost feel bad telling you this story, but I told you I'm 19. I've started to preach. God lays it upon my heart to start a little magazine with the gospel. It was all gospel, gathered out all over Ireland. One people for the Lord. You know, you're 19 and you want to go. And I went to a local Christian bookstore, and they don't have many of those in Ireland. wasn't too far away from our home on York Road in Belfast. And there were several sisters, literal physical sisters, who ran the store. And one of them was, uh, I don't know what age she was, maybe in her 60s at that time, and I'm 19. And she recognized me. And she had been a Christian all these years. Her family were missionaries. And uh, she said uh, to me, what are you doing these days? I said, well, the Lord has led us. We have just launched our magazine. <laughs> she said like that, <laughs> that's the last thing we need in the kingdom of God is another magazine. She was so angry. I just went in to buy a book. And here am I, what is it, 50 years later, still telling you the story. Discouragement is an awful thing. Discouragement. You get to the point, you say, oh, why bother? If you know the quick on the draw, if you know the ASA principle, discouragement won't bother you nearly as much as it used to. If you take those first five minutes in fighting with the devil, you'll get the victory and the atmosphere will be cleared. If you don't get the victory, the atmosphere will become more and more one of discouragement until you're on that slippery slope and who knows when you will recover if ever. I don't say that little story to put her down, but just as an idea, words can hurt and leave lasting impressions. So be very careful with your words. But remember this, whoever comes against you or whatever tempts you or discourages you, what you do is, as soon as Jesus heard this, the ASA principle, as soon as he immediately countered it, Let's read on. Attack us, surprise us, tempt us, discourage us. In each instance, we are to respond immediately. Let me ask for a little show of hands. Are you, are you getting the point, friend? Just a little show of hands. Learn it, friend. Learn it. Learn it. Immediately. In each instance, we are to respond immediately. Look at me for a moment. Here's the crazy thing, even about us believers. Perhaps it's because we're still in the flesh. But actually, when the devil says something to us, you know what our first inclination is, unless you're trained better? It's actually to verbalize an agreement with the devil. He says something, there's not much good going on, and then you verbalize it maybe to a friend, oh, I'm, I'm finished, I'm quitting, or I'll never get out of this, or this will never. You're just agreeing with the devil. You're making things worse, and it'll grow and grow and grow. God only knows where it'll end up unless you nip it in the bud. So it says here, back to your notes, in each instance we are to respond immediately. 
Do not take minutes. I want to say this again. Do not take minutes or hours or days to meditate on what the devil is saying. Rather, jump on it as soon as. I've got to say that with more oomph. Jump on it as soon as. Learn the power of the word no when dealing with the enemy. Look this way. I guess you're aware that outside of the name of the Lord, the most powerful words in the English language are the two words yes and no. They're powerful. Yes to God, no to the devil. So look what it says in Romans 8, 36 and 37. And listen to what Paul says. Let's look at it. Look at it. As it is written, it is written, Paul says, and by the way, he said, we could agree with this and feel terrible. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. There was a certain amount of truth in that because Paul was hounded like a dog. But you know what Paul said to that which he could have said and agreed with? With all his troubles and those people attacking him, he could have said, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But he only quoted that to show how we should handle that kind of a situation where we're killed all the day long or accounted as sheep for the slaughter. For verse 37 gives his response. And the first word is what? Nay. What is that in English? No. No. No, 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 no. Have you ever heard a mother say to her little child who's playing around, now don't you do that and she's laughing so much that he's doing it that he's encouraged to do it again? She said no, but she didn't mean it. But when you say no, devil, or if you want to have a touch of Irish in it, then you can say go to hell, devil. Whatever way you want to say it, no, devil, with strength and power. That's what Paul said, no. He said, I am not going to say that. I must tell you what happened to me one time in England, but I'll read the rest of the verse first. Nay, or no, rather than saying, verse 36, look at it closely, rather than saying, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter, feeling sorry for ourselves, and agreeing with discouragement, instead of saying that, this is what we will say. No, in all these things. And these were things that was coming against him. He said, in all these things, we could add to it, that are coming against me, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Many, many, many moons ago, as they say, many, many years ago. I don't even remember where it was, except it was in England. And the, the, I was asked to speak at a convention. There's a lot of people there. I can still kind of see part of it in my mind's eye, kind of a square place. And it was like a castle, uh, which had this turned into this kind of meeting room, and I was asked to be one of the speakers. It wasn't our arrangement. I was asked to be one of the speakers, and I did speak. And in the course of speaking, I quoted this very thing I'm quoting to you, where Paul had the opportunity to go around saying, we're killed all day long, a sheep to the slaughter, people are, are accounting us, and we're just, just but no! Well, this is the truth. I'm standing at the front. It shouldn't have happened, but I'm going to tell you what did happen. I'm standing at the front speaking. And when I got to that, no! This man at the back jumped up, and he went out here, and he ran up the aisle, and he was a Church of England minister. You know how sedate they normally are, and how quiet and nice. He came running up the aisle right over to me. I didn't know what he was going to do. And he grabbed hold around my stomach here, and he started to bounce me up and down like this. It seemed to last forever. And he was in the middle of a message. And he's bouncing me all over the place, and people were clapping and laughing, and he was shouting at the top of his voice, I never saw it before. I never saw it before. This is the secret. This is what I've been looking for. Glory to God. No, he said, no. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. Finally, we got him calmed down and got him back to his seat and went on with the message. You know, you don't normally do that when truth hits you, but that's what the Church of England minister did. Truth hit him. You have a choice. And the choice is to say, for thy sake, we're killed all day long. You know, since I've followed you, everything's gone wrong. Since I've followed you, this one's against me and that one's against me and my body hurts and I have enough money. Ah, you can say that. Or you can say like Paul, when everything was coming against him, he said no to that kind of stuff. But yes to what? In all these things, we are more than conquerors. 
wasn't it uh, Evander, what do you call the boxer? Holly, Holly, Hollyfield. Wasn't it him that said one time when somebody asked him this, about this scripture, what did it mean more than conquerors? Apparently he was a church man too. And he said he knew what more than conquerors meant. He said because he was in the ring one time and he fought and he won and he got six million dollars. Always remember the figures, six million dollars. He said, that made me the conqueror. I was the champ. And he said, I went home and his wife said to him, hand it over. And he said, I handed over the check for six million. He said, I was a conqueror and she was more than a conqueror. <laughs> I always, always tell the story uh, one time when Ruth was very small, Leslie was smaller, this was in Ireland, and we were playing this little game of soccer. And uh, I had scored two goals against Leslie. And Ruth Ann announced that I was leading three goals to zero. Three to zero. I'd only scored two and only taken two shots. And so we stopped to point out it was impossible to take two shots and have three goals. Oh, she said, it makes no difference. I saw it. You only took two shots, but you got three goals. Well, I thanked her for her, <laughs> for her confidence in me. The truth is this. That would make you more than a conqueror. Paul said, I'm not just a conqueror. He said, I've only taken two shots at it and I've scored three goals. I'm way over the top. I am more than a conqueror, more than a conqueror through him that loved me and gave himself for me. Why? Because not only he countered the devil's words with God's word, he learned the secret of doing it on the spot. Want to say it again? Are you still with me? Wave at me. Let's look then at what it says. If the devil gets you in the first five minutes of the day, or of a situation, or of an experience, it could be somebody gets you mad driving home. If the devil gets you in the first five minutes of the day, he has a great chance of dominating you all day long. Isn't that sad? And if he gets you one day, he'll probably get you over the weekend. And he'll probably get you next week too. Don't let it happen. A-S-A. It says here, do not allow it to happen. And then it says three times over, say nay, say nay, say nay. Nay, of course, is no. Or say no, no. What are we going to say then, Leslie? Say, the Lord is my shepherd. And say it fast. I shall not want. No devil, no devil, no devil. No, 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 no. Let us examine several more scriptures. We'll just read these bits and pieces here as we go along and see how many we can get a chance to look at. Oh, this is powerful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you. Oh, there hath no temptation, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, the devil really has no new tricks in his arsenal. Same old, same old. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Look at me while I tell you something. God censors every tomorrow before it gets to you. And if there's anything in it too tough for you, he won't let it by. So if it gets through to you, it's a backhanded compliment from God to say, I know that you're strong enough to whip this thing. You remember that? There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above your able. Did you hear that? He will not allow you. you say this pressure is too much. God will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, and then it says with this, oh, this is powerful. But will with the temptation, look at me, how, 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 in, in, in a time-lapse thing, how, how soon is with? If, if you're walking with somebody, it doesn't mean you're one yard behind or one yard in front. You're walking with them. And it says here that every temptation that comes, God will with the temptation. At the same time, God's not going to help you just 10 hours later, but right there on the spot, quick on the draw, it says, will with the temptation make a way to escape, not off escape. You could have a way off escape and not use it. But when it says to escape, it means you use it, that ye may be able to bear it. 
What news is this? Look this way and rejoice with every temptation and every battle with it. It's almost like a Siamese twin. God sends his power to deliver you. For there's nothing that comes your way that you cannot bear. But God, with the temptation, gives you the way to get the victory over it. And what do you do? Well, it's like these two things coming at you, and you don't side with the devil. You side with God's way to escape his scripture, and you say, no devil, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or some similar scripture, and you start to glorify God one more time, friends. You can save yourself days, weeks, months, or even years of trouble by adopting quick on the draw. That's a great scripture, isn't it? Hebrews 4, verse 15. This is good too. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus has been through it before, and it says, We have not an high priest which cannot be tempted with the feeling of our infirmities. Look back at me. If it just said that he bore our infirmities, we could say, well, he's big and strong. He can bear our infirmities. It says more than that. Or our battles, not just sickness, our battles. It says he was touched with the feelings. Easy to get your feelings hurt. Even from somebody maybe that didn't even mean it. But you pick it up wrong. The Bible says he was touched with our feelings, our sensitivities. And what you do is you don't go into a sour mood for a month and snipe back at that person and say, well, I'm going to get them just like they got me. Of course not. You don't do that. You say what? No devil. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And you do it. I hope when you go home, you'll remember more than. Although that's not bad because it gets the point over, doesn't it? Ephesians 4:27. It says, neither give place. Well, that's good to the devil. But the, the original word, which I looked up, neither give place, that is, don't give an opportunity to the devil. He's going to get ways to attack you without you assisting the devil. Don't assist him by giving in to him and refusing to quote God's word. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, Oh, this is a powerful one. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Look back at me for a moment. Do you know what Peter is actually saying here? When there's been a big attack upon you, listen to this. The temptation for the believer is not so much to be hurt, Peter says, by the attack as he's hurt by the feeling of why the attack. Why, why, why did this happen to me? I think it's all confused. Never try to ask God a whole lot of questions for which at this point he's not going to give you answers. You'll only get into an argument with God and he always wins. Don't do it that way. Beloved, think it not strange. So Peter was, was not so much upset with the fiery trial as he was with the reaction of the believer who gets all tangled up of thinking, why am I suffering this? It's the devil. Fight him and glorify God. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's not strange for it to be attacked. But rejoice, rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, that is, at the second coming. I'm going to go ahead with some more of these scriptures. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. That doesn't mean you resist him three weeks later. You know, you've heard of people filing a lawsuit three years after something happened. Say, well, why the wait or whatever? And sometimes the statute of limitation runs out. Don't you wait for a month before you start getting up again in your inner spirit and fighting the devil. Resist the devil. Do it on the spot. And he will flee from you. Not he might. He will. Do you like these scriptures I'm giving you? Aren't they all good weapons? Psalm 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. 
not just when the enemy was a hundred yards away, but when the, the hand of the enemy was just about on the back of your neck, you keep shouting, say so. Number seven, Hebrews 11, verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, here's the two big deals. You must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not that he's a rewarder of those that diligently agree with the devil. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'm repeating it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. If fear strikes you, that's what to say. Learn Psalm 27, verse 1. When fear strikes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 2 Timothy 1, 7, and then we've only got number 10 to go. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and a balanced mind that's got peace. So what do you do with fear then? You quote this very scripture, the one before. And number 10, Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in. There's no judgment coming on you when you're in Christ. Look this way. You remember I've talked before to you and I'm through with this. In the Old Testament, the man who killed a neighbor accidentally, he maybe was using an ax and the head flew off and hit somebody in their head and he died. So it was an accidental. It was manslaughter. Today the law calls one thing murder, but if it's an accident, it calls it manslaughter. And God said to the children of Israel when they had, this is the land of Israel, and on, here's Jordan, and on this side, God had three cities of refuge and three on this side. And all were within half a day's running distance. And it's said that when a fellow did that and <clears throat> accidentally killed somebody else, that fellow who died, his loved ones, because his blood was shed, had the right to come after this fellow and shed his blood and kill him. So he had to take off and run and run and run and run and run until he got into the city of refuge. And once he got in there, they closed the gates and he was safe. Paul has that in mind when he says this, there is therefore no judgment to them which are in. We may not be perfect, but we're in. Who are we in? We're in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, that means not trying to get saved by religious works, but after the Spirit. And I close with this, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's two laws here. L-A-W, the law of the spirit of life. You got the spirit of God, you praise him, life comes. As life comes, you praise the spirit of God and you get more life. It's like an ongo ongoing, nonstop law of spirit and life. And hath made me free from the other law of sin and death. Look, 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 look. We sin or the devil discouraged us and told us we had sinned. And what happens? We get to feel miserable about it. And so that's death blows to our minds and our spirits. And the more death blows you have as a Christian to your mind and your spirit, the more death blows, the weaker you are. And it's all the easier for the devil to get you to sin again. And if you sin again, there's more death. So the law is sin encourages death. That is death to the mind, death to the spirit. And death encourages sin. Sin and death, sin and death. On and on it goes. It's a vicious circle. And God says the only way that can be broken is the other law of spirit and life. Spirit, filled with the spirit, filled with God's life. Why? Because we learn, look at me, you'll see it for the last time. I might do it so fast, you won't see it. Look at me. Did you see it? What are the three words in the principle? The, the three letters, excuse me. The A. a S A principle. Say it out loud. The A S A principle. Stand to your feet and praise the Lord with me, will you, please? Just let's praise the Lord together. Come on, let's praise Him together. <clears throat> Open your mouth and praise Him. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.